and welcome to Tech to Tech presented by Kaizen, where we will explore common cleaning questions and answers. This session has been pre recorded and will include additional FAQs related to this specific topic at the end of the presentation. We hope it is 15 minutes well spent. Let's get started. I would like to introduce Kaizen Zone, Will Sweet. Thanks, William, and thank you everyone for joining what will be a short talk on. Um, aluminum corrosion, so essentially summertime corrosion and how to prevent the deteriorating of metals. In this case, it is obviously going to be aluminum, and that is what corrosion is. Essentially, it's the deteriorating of the aluminum itself. The agenda for today, we're going to start off with some examples. What exactly is corrosion and um, in particular what it looks like when it comes to aluminum parts? We're going to move on to the causes. So um, what causes corrosion? in aluminum applications. And finally, we're going to finish this off with preventing it and curing aluminum corrosion in your aluminum process. And to start off the presentation, I will be breaking that agenda um, with a quick tidbit on uh, aluminum oxide itself. So whenever aluminum corrodes, it's actually creating a substance called aluminum oxide. And I wanted to spend a second on this because um, there are a lot of applications out there, especially high reliability aerospace applications, that actually desire this aluminum oxide. It can be a good thing. Um, aluminum oxide in and of itself is corrosion resistant. So after you do get this, this start of corrosion buildup, that layer that of aluminum oxide that it builds is actually very corrosion resistant. So there are definitely applications out there um, that would prefer for a longer um, corrosion resistant material as long as they can live with the look of it. And I'll get a little bit into that on the next slide. So. Back on track, we are talking about aluminum corrosion. What this is, it is an electrochemical reaction between a material and its environment that it produces a deterioration of the metal and its properties. So the metal is essentially deteriorating away and what its specifications were no longer are as it starts to corrode. What this aluminum oxide looks like is usually whitish in hue. So as you can see on the picture to the right, it is whitish in color and it is not black. I wanted to make that distinction because if you're seeing black deterioration on your aluminum parts, it means you're probably cleaning them or using some high alkalinity or high alkaline products on them. And aluminum does not like high alkalinity, and that's a completely different chemical process. So, and then again, like I mentioned a second ago on the tidbit, this aluminum oxide is desired in some applications. Some of the high reliability industries that aluminum is used in and that you'll probably have to be wary of aluminum oxide are aerospace, of course, and then um, automotive as well. There's a lot of the car frames and uh, a lot of the new car frames today are made out of aluminum to reduce the amount of weight that the, the total car has. So you'll see that a lot in automotive and then, of course, medical as well. Many stethoscopes out there actually use aluminum in their uh, manufacturing. So the causes of corrosion in aluminum working facilities, um, one of these is galvanic corrosion, and this is when two dissimilar metals become electrically connected. This is typically done, um, say, in immersion processes. They're being immersed in water together, and, um, and then an electric current flows through that water, electrically connecting the two different types of metal. In this process, um, there's one metal, a cathode, and another one that is the anode. The cathode is always protected, and the anode kind of serves as the shield and it takes all of the corrosive action. If you look at the table to the right, um, you'll see that the, the materials towards the top are more active, so they serve as anodes more often than not. If you have a bath with aluminum in it and brass in it, the aluminum is gonna be the one that receives the corrosive action and acts as the shield for the copper. So, like I've mentioned a couple of times already, um, there are applications out there where this is actually this is the desired outcome. They force galvanic corrosion so that they say that the copper part is more important in the specific application. So they want to use the alu aluminum as the shield to make sure the copper is protected. And then of course, just like all every other type of metal, heat and humidity are leading causes for corrosion. So I mean, just like steel, um, you want to limit heat and humidity, but it's also worth noting that corrosion is not as destabilizing for aluminum processes as it is for steel. If you find um, corrosion or rust in your steel process, 
it can be detrimental to the whole operation and you have to act quickly to make sure that it doesn't spread. It may not be as detrimental when it comes to aluminum, especially if you can live with um, some of the whitish hue that we saw earlier. So these summer months um, can be in particularly painful for every factory. And that's because there's higher heat and there's higher humidity. So there's more chance of corrosion in any of your processes. So places like Florida and Louisiana have to deal with this year round, especially if, if you're in the United States, those are some of the more susceptible places, but all around the world, if you're closer to the equator, um, it's going to be it's going to be tougher on you throughout the year. Moving on to cures and prevention, like we were just talking about um, with the high heat and humidity, um, improving your warehouse conditions are one of the best ways to decrease the amount of uh, corrosion that you see in your facility. Any form of temperature controlling is better than no form of temperature temperature controlling. Of course, if you can be, have a full AC environment, that is the best you can do when it comes to temperature. But if you can only um, cool your facility down two or three degrees, it's better than not cooling it down those two or three degrees at all. Similarly, that's the same story with humidity, actually. Especially during those summer months that I mentioned, um, if if you want to, maybe your method of decreasing humidity is just to finally close the doors out on the floor. That's one way to keep some of the humidity outside as opposed to coming inside. But you can also um, replace all of the insulation in your facility. Um, but any, any, either way, something is better than nothing when it comes to decreasing humidity. Both of these um, controlling actions, if you're going to control temperature or humidity, can be expensive. But so is a high reject rate. That's a lot of lost money if you're losing a lot of parts because of corrosion or rust. So that's something to weigh the cost and benefits for as well. Product protection is another way that you can help limit the amount of corrosion that you see in your processes. Um, you can do that with, with aqueous dry films, neutral or mild alkaline pH, because remember aluminum does not like the high alkalinity. And um, typically, you'll when you use this process, you're going to see a very thin dry film after you finish processing it. A lot of times, if you're using a low concentration with these materials, it's uh, not visible to the human eye. But if you need longer term or better better protection, um, it may be a little bit thicker. And eventually, as you increase concentrations, you may see that dry film a little bit. Of course, oil wet films, the same oil uh, that you're using in in machining processes to lubricate the parts and stuff like that, um, that that oil will also serve as a corrosion protector. However, um, most end users are probably not going to want oily parts, so that's something to consider. A lot of times they need um, cleaner looking parts, so you may have to go a different way. And finally, sealed bags and paper are one of the best foolproof ways to ensure that no corrosion happens on your parts. That's after processing, you wrap them and completely seal them away from humidity and oxygen. And that is a great way to make sure that um, corrosion does not happen further down the line. And finally, um, say you've, you've already missed the boat on these corrosion protecting capabilities and you have corrosion and rust in your facility. Now you need to remove it. One way to do that is with an aque aqueous acid solution. Typically that is citric acid. Citric acid is safe on aluminum, and it happens to brighten aluminum parts as well. Citric acid is probably one of the leaders in brightening some of the yellow metals like brass, um, and that's where it really thrives, but it also has some brightening capabilities on aluminum as well. So that's one way to do it, or um, there are blasting and vibratory bowls out there as well. I'd recommend using sand or some softer medias in those applications. Um, it's worth mentioning here too, um, that you shouldn't mix metals in bowls like this. You can run the risk of galvanic corrosion that we were talking about earlier. And that's if you have steel and aluminum in the same bowl and somehow an ele electrical current gets in, um, you can start to corrode the aluminum because that is higher up on the galvanic scale. And that's about all that I have so far. So I will move on to the frequently asked questions. Uh, how long does it take to remove rust from aluminum? And that's a little bit tricky of a question. Uh, it depends on how you're going to do it. If you're going to do it with a sand blasting cabinet, for instance, that can be pretty quick. You, um, If you remember back to the machine I showed last slide, 
you actually, the operator sticks their hands in the machine onto one part. They're holding one part and they can localize the blast to wherever the rust is. So you can do that pretty quickly and efficiently. However, that's a one piece flow. You can only do, you can only really hold one part at a time, whether it's a, if, especially if it's a tube or a larger part. Um, but if you're going to use, say, an aqueous dip tank, um, that's a little bit more efficient. You can put more than one part in there. However, it's still going to take um, a significant amount of time because you want to make sure that all of the corrosion is removed. And if it's not all removed, you run the risk of that corrosion spreading. So I say typically in processes, it's going to be a little bit longer than a normal aqueous cleaning process. So, I mean, it could be upwards of 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, but it, it is important to make sure that all of the rust is removed. Moving on, um, why do steel CPs, corrosion protectors, not protect aluminum? Um, short answer to that is it's just they're not designed for aluminum. They're different types of metal, so you have to use different components in those chemistries to make sure that it actually matches up and sticks on the surface of that part. The little bit longer um, answer to that question is that a lot of the steel CPs have a little bit higher alkalinity in them. And we've mentioned a couple of times that aluminum does not like high alkalinity and it can actually eat away at the metal itself. Um, so that's another reason why you need to have a, a different type of corrosion protector um, protecting aluminum parts than you do steel. And finally, how long will a sealed bag or paper keep parts from corroding? Um, short answer to that one is indefinitely, if you do it correctly. So if you correctly seal the parts and make sure that no um, humidity or oxygen can get inside of the bag where the part is, it's not good. There's no no way for it to start to corrode. So if you're going to be shipping parts overseas, um, over yeah, a long ship ride in high humidity environments, I would recommend bags or paper if you can. Um, and that's one of the surefire ways to make sure that oxygen can't get in and start to corrode your part. So I believe that's all the time that I have for today, so I will pass it back over to William. Thanks, Will. And thank you guys for watching this Tech to Tech session. If you'd like to discuss this topic further or have any questions not answered in this session, please contact your local Kaizen regional manager or send an email to tech the number two tech at kaizen.com and we will have someone follow up with you as soon as possible. Do you want to have exclusive access to future content sent directly to your inbox or do you know someone who would benefit from these sessions? If the answer is yes, just go to tech to tech by kaizen.com and fill out the subscription form. And if you like this video, be sure to follow us on our social media platforms for more expert cleaning content. Mm -hmm.